So, a couple of weeks ago, it might have been last week, I posted about direct instruction in online teaching and learning. Here is the article on my blog, but I also posted it on the CTLE blog. So you can read that post. I'll put a link in this video so you can get to that. But basically, in this post, I wanted to explore what the list of examples of direct instruction look like in a real online course. So if you see, you'll read this article and then at the bottom there is a list. So I'll go through the list and then show you options for how this might look in a course. Now keep in mind that there are many ways to skin a cat. That's such a weird saying. So time out. I'll admit that I wasted at least 15 minutes researching where that phrase originated. So I'll put a link too so you can waste some time as well. All right, time back in. So the following video shows examples and provides some suggested tools and implementation practices that you can use if you want to try the strategy yourself. These are all pretty basic, so I'll try to spice it up a bit for you so you can maybe try something new. But if you see anything you want to try, send me a message or contact the CTLE and maybe we can set up a workshop for you. All right, so keep in mind that there are lots of different ways to do these things. So let's go ahead and start with number one, pre-recorded video lectures. The instructor records a lecture on a specific topic and posts it for students to watch in their own, uh, at their own pace. Okay, so this first example is in my writing course. You can see that I've used a screen capture tool to record me talking about a particular essay. And then students can click through on these different essays or lectures that they can get information about and they can watch them on their own time when we are actually doing that paper. So how to write paper one, how to write paper two, how to write paper three, and they just click on these until they have watched them all. And so they're available, they can watch them all up front or they can watch them when we get to this point in the course. So the tool here is just using a screen capture tool. In this example, I'm using YouTube videos that I have put into Canvas Studio. And I do that because in this case, I really want for students to watch them. So when they click on them, they have to actually answer questions in order to pass the lecture. So I added the YouTube video into Canvas Studio and then added a quiz to go with that uh, lecture. So now when students start watching it, there will be questions that will pop up throughout this timeline. I actually have the questions hidden so that students won't just go right to that area to answer the questions, so they have to watch it. I do notice, because I can see how much time they've spent, that they do speed it up a little bit. So they speed it up to two times the speed, and it gets through instead of 10 minutes and five minutes, and then they find the questions. I'm hoping that they are actually learning something by doing that, if they are indeed doing that. And then down below, I can see any insights to see how my students have done. Okay, the next example on the list is slide presentations. The instructor creates a slide presentation with information and explanations on a specific topic and post it for students to view. So in English 102, it is a hybrid high flex class. So I have some students who are in line on a webinar and the others are in class. And so in order to keep us all on the same page, I've created slides using a tool called hellosmart.com. What that allows for me to do is to create these slideshows. And once students are in class, I can have everybody log in and register, which they, what they'll do at the very beginning. And then we could go through these slides to help keep us on track. I don't use them in a traditional sense of, of a slide, but it just lets the, everyone know that if they look on this particular platform, they'll know exactly where we are at, that, at any given time throughout the class. And so I, I click through these and then at the very end, I give them a exit ticket and then students are able to participate in the exit ticket by adding their input on their individual devices. So they'll see this wrap up exit ticket slide and then when I hit next, we can uh, allow for students to add their information and then I can re review the results. So I have them do a quick poll question, how do you feel about this class? And I did have about four students who were, were confused. It was the first week. But then on the second slide, I have students respond three times. They can either give me three facts that they learned in class, they can ask me two questions that they have about the class, or they can give me one opinion. And they can put their three entries anywhere. So most of them chose to put in three facts. 
And then this is sort of how I take attendance. I will see at the end of the class who participated here, and then I'll know who was in class and participating. So I don't normally use a lot of slides, but I do in the introduction uh, orientation. So in this example, I use the slide deck to present information to students about the course. So I'm using SCORM content to create this. So this is created in a program called Articulate 360. And then I use my slides, which I record them, and then it creates this auto-playing lesson. And as students go through the lesson, I can embed questions in the lesson. So here where I'm talking about the grading policy, I'm basically going through the key points of the syllabus and then I ask questions that are embedded in. So here's an example of a question. And then after they answer the question, they can go back to the slides and the slides will auto record and, and play. So I can either go on or retry it. And so I don't know if you can hear it, but there's me talking over these slides. So number three is written resources. The instructor provides written resources, such as a reading assignment or a textbook for students to read and study. Well, that's an easy one. So in my journalism class, I use OER materials instead of a textbook. And so for each module or each unit, they will have a unit one lecture and then a unit one reading. And then in addition to the reading that I provide, I make handouts for them. So the reading are current event links that are related to journalism. Journalism is ever changing, so a textbook is kind of old by the time it comes out. So here I give them some required readings and then I have recommended readings. And these are all just links out to very current uh, media articles that are on the web. The second source also generally comes from credible sources on the web and I just create them in, as a document in Canvas or a page in Canvas. And so sometimes I link out and other times I create a page. It all just depends on what it is and what I'm thinking for that particular day. Sometimes I want them to be handouts and sometimes I'd rather them go to the website because I want them to be familiar with that website. All right, so nothing fancy there, just using Canvas. But number four, online quizzes and assessments. The instructor creates online quizzes and assessments to check for understanding and provide feedback to students. All right, so in that same journalism class, there are two things I use. I use Canvas quizzes, but also my students in that journalism class, we provide access for them to the AP Stylebook online. And with this free tool for them, it's not free for me, but free for them, they can have AP style quizzes. And so what they do is they go in and I tell them each week to take any three quizzes, but I tell them what area that their real quiz for the week will be in, and then they can take the quizzes based on that area. But basically, once they take their quizzes, they have the results here and they can share those results with me. But then back in Canvas for that week, I've created a real quiz for them. And I say real quiz, but it's no different from the other quizzes, just a little longer. And in Canvas, you can create quizzes and the students are given multiple attempts on the quiz and they answer the quiz based on what they've read that week in their AP style book. All right, so Canvas quizzes, but number five is online discussions. The instructor provides a forum for students to discuss the material and ask questions. This one's kind of creative. Obviously in Canvas, you can create the standard discussion forum. You can make them small groups or just the whole class discussion. This is a fairly small class. So students can then start to add their information. Now, the problem with this is it gets a little boring after a while when you're having to read through a bunch of text like this. So another option is to use a different tool. So in my journalism class, I have them using Flipgrid for their discussions. So instead of students just regurgitating a bunch of text, what they do now is they can see and hear each other talking. And so when they click this link, it takes them over to Flipgrid. And then each student is able to add their content and we can watch them talk to us about what they've learned about convergence journalism. And then they can reply to each other. So over here on the left, I have one of my favorite students, Benjamin, who's talking, uh, presenting his information on convergence journalism. And then on the right side here, we have a series of responses to Benjamin's post. So all of these students are replying to Benjamin 
in video. So that's one of my favorites. So number six, interactive activities. The instructor creates interactive activities such as simulations or games to help students better understand the material. So in Journalism 213, Writing for Online, I'm not really big on the simulations or games, but one of the things that would be considered a simulation is students are pretending that they are writing for an online news magazine called the Weekly Gaucho. And so they are authors for this newspaper and then they post their stories online. And this is a live website open to the web. So we pay close attention to that. We pretend like they're real newsroom reporters. I'm the editor. I tell them when they've done things that are that are not appropriate and we take their stories down. So in a sense, it's kind of a simulation, but not really. We stretched on that one. But let's move on to seven, self-reflection opportunities. The instructor provides opportunities for students to reflect on what they have learned and how they can apply it. So here's an example of just a writing assignment in my journalism class. We do it at the end of the semester in this class, but I'm asking students to write a 500 to 600 word self-assessment and it kind of gets them to reflect on what they've learned and what their future goals are going to be. But I also do it in a different way in my freshman composition course. So each module, my students will write a research prospectus. I get them to reflect on what they've done previously and then think about where they're going next. And so this is one of the very first ones that they do and they've just decided on which type of paper they're going to write. So they're explaining to me why they made that choice you know, and then I want for them to tell me how their project is going in general. So they're all working on individual research topics and research projects. And so this is the opportunity for them to uh, tell me how it's going. And then later in the semester, I have them do it in video, but not recorded. I actually have them set up online conferences with me. And so they, they sign up for an online conference and then they come in and they basically tell me the same thing, you know, how their project is going, you know, what do they need help on? And they're basically reflecting on that process. It works really well, especially these online conferences. All right, so number eight, live online lectures. The instructor conducts live online lectures, providing explanations and answering questions in real time. So in my journalism class, so my journalism, both of them are online courses. And so the idea started with having a live lecture every Monday morning to get students started with the week. Now that has sort of transformed into just recorded lecture, but initially, and I still do offer students the ability to join me if they want to join me live. No one ever shows up for the past five years. So basically I just record them, but it kind of looks like this each week, Monday morning, I post or Monday afternoon, I'll post a video and then students can watch that video and it basically walks them through what we're going to be doing that week and it tries to answer questions that I have anticipated that students might have for that week. So every Monday morning, my online classes get that. In my English 102 hybrid class, those students get a live lecture as well. So they can come to class or they can join me with this link to our Zoom live online link and they can join me from home and so those options are available but that is a live lecture now i always tell students that they'd be better off to just watch the shortened condensed version that i post in announcements instead of watching an hour and 15 minutes of a live class where there's a lot of just interaction and engagement going on that's not going to be helpful if you weren't there all right, nine, office hour. The instructor holds office hour sessions where students can ask questions and receive feedback. All right, so this is an easy one. I'm sure everyone is doing that. So this is a copy of my syllabus. And on the sy syllabus, I put down the times that I'm available. And then I actually have a schedule where students can sign up. So when they click this link, they end up on my Google sign up page and they can choose a time to sign up to meet with me. And so their name will pre-populate in here with their email address and then they can book that time and then I get an update in my Google Calendar and the Google Meet is already in there so students will be able to see the Google Meet information and they get email reminders 
um, so they'll show up on time. All right, last one, feedback on assignments. Oh, I love this one. The instructor provides feedback on assignments to guide students' understanding and progress. So I'm an English teacher, and I wouldn't be a very good one if I didn't scribble all over my students' papers. So in this case, I'm just using my iPad in the Canvas app, which allows for me to use my pen and I can write right on these papers and give students feedback right there. I also use rubrics in Canvas. So in addition to providing step-by-step -step instructions for an, an assignment, at the very bottom of the assignment, there is a rubric. And each rubric is very, uh, not detailed, but it goes into each part or each step that they were supposed to complete. And so it makes it really easy for students to see where they lost points and how they might want to improve that. So that's it. Those examples illustrate how direct instruction can be adapted to an online teaching setting. But it's important to remember that direct instruction methods should be used in conjunction with other methods to enhance students' engagement and apply the knowledge acquired. And like I said in the beginning, there's always more than one way to skin a cat. So if you're not doing what I'm doing, that doesn't mean you're not doing it right.